panel in this year's TEF, which happens to be, for reasons that I'm not quite sure of, all male. We had the all, all female one before the break, and now this is no. Overall, it's balanced. This panel is a bit different. Good. I think let's start. Um, now, in, in this panel, we're trying to move from uh, sort of the world of, of AI in a sort of abstract level of, of what is AI and what are the implications to something that is, I think, much more closer to the heart and daily experience of most of the people in this room. We're talking about the one thing that translators think about today most when they hear artificial intelligence, with it, which is neural machine translation. Uh, a thing that has come about, well, it was mentioned in, in the previous panel, it, the idea or the concepts have been around since 1997, but in the last one and a half, two years, suddenly it has become from an esoteric, geeky idea to, to something that actually is used uh, in, in the case of DG translation, where I come from every day by translators in their daily work. Um, we will try to cover this topic to the extent possible. Um, try to create some clarity on what neural machine translation means. How it, how it works, we'll probably not figure out. But we will have, have some ideas on, on how, it, how it can be used, how it could be used better, what it means maybe for, for translators to work with NeuralMT. Um, I'm very happy to, to introduce our panel briefly. But before I do that, uh, I have to say, if you have the printed uh, version of the program, you see that we had a speaker, Josef van Genabit, who's on the program, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. We send him all the best. I'm sure he's, using, he's watching the web stream, and I hope we do him proud. Um, but uh, just I would like you to meet our, our panelists, starting with uh, the gentleman to my left, Matt Post, who is a researcher from John Hopkins University. And I'd just like you to say, how, how did you get into this field, or what do you find fascinating about MT and neural MT in specific? Uh, yeah, okay, so um, I did my PhD in uh, machine translation, so I started graduate school a uh, long time ago, and I got my PhD in 2010, so my dissertation was on uh, incorporating syntax into machine translation, so I think it was just being in graduate school, getting interested in the old paradigm at that point, which was uh, the statistical approach, and uh, so uh, the neural approach nowadays is uh, pretty exciting. I think there's a, a big sentiment uh, on the part of researchers, at least, that uh, the, research, the research had gotten a bit stale and uh, had sort of, we we're seeing a lot of uh, diminishing returns. Uh, so neural MT is very exciting. It's a very different architecture, and uh, um, we see much better uh, quality uh, by a number of metrics. So uh, from the research side, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Bruno Pulquin is, comes to us from Geneva yesterday evening, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Bruno, please say a few words. So uh, um, about my history, I began with natural language processing, developing tools to extract texts, information from text. Then I worked for the European Commission for a while, doing multilingual text mining. And finally, uh, doing multilingual, I entered the field of machine translation, and I joined the WIPO, where I started doing patent uh, machine translation, and uh, we built our own um, MT tool. Now it's using a neural MT, and we export it in different international organizations, too. So uh, I'm, I mean, I, I like this, this field of uh, neural MT because with, with a small team, I mean, until recently we were only two working on, on that project. With a small team using open source, you manage to, to create a um, competitive uh, machine translation tool provided that you use the right data from, from, the, from the domain. Um, and uh, so my, my business is really machine learning, so I'm really more in the technical side of it. Um, and I'm happy to be here because I'm between academia and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the the the, um, the dark side. Say it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now this is sorry. John Tinsley <laughs> comes Peace. from. Okay, okay, well, that's what they all say. Uh, <laughs> could you tell us a, a few words about yourself? You are a CEO. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Iconic Translation Machines, which is a commercial machine translation provider based out of Dublin, Ireland. So I have a similar background to Matt. Um, I have a PhD in machine translation, which I got in 2009, uh, and it was on, also on incorporating syntactic information 
um, into machine translation. And I guess soon after that, I, I, I moved sides from the academic world into commercial machine translation. So I worked um, on an EU project called Pluto uh, that ended up being commercialized and, and turned into what Iconic is today. Um, and as Matt said, so we were working on applications of, so I guess what we do as a company is, is the opposite of what a lot of you might be familiar with in terms of MT, which is the general purpose machine translation that you see online. We work on adapting machine translation for specific use cases for specific industries and down to the level of specific clients. And I guess a couple of years ago, we'd reached the point where the technology had its limits. So we kind of plateaued with the capabilities of statistical machine translation. We knew what it could do, we knew what it couldn't do, and we were working with that. And so the impact that NeuralMT has had over the last couple of years is that it's, it's kind of opened the doors to new opportunities, to new languages we couldn't get over the line in terms of quality before, to new use cases. So uh, I guess I'm hoping on this panel that I can bring some insight from our perspective as to how our machine translation is being used, who it's being used by, um, and, and kind of bring some, some info like that. Good, let's, let's see how we approach it. If you look at the history of machine translation, I, I always felt it is a history of, of hubris and huge disappointment. When we go back to the 1950s, when, when it really started in earnest, there, there were researchers who said, well, the language problem will be solved within three or four years. This is obviously feasible with the, the computers they had in the day and a couple of dictionaries in English and Russian. And, and we know where this went uh, into the, the winter in the 1960s. when. Uh, Google came out with uh, their statistical MT system beginning of the 2000s. I had colleagues coming back from conferences saying, guys, we need to find new jobs, it's over. Um, and it didn't quite happen, we're still here. And, and now we have neural MT, which is, is very promising. Um, but is it, is, it, is it not just another hype? Or why is it not just another hype? Let's be more positive about this. Uh, is it, is it the, the paradigm shift that really changes uh, substantially what MT can do, or is it just the preparation for the next great disappointment? Maybe, Matt, if you want to <laughs> tackle this one. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think there, there certainly is a reality that it's, uh, it's quite different. So, um, as you say, if you look in the histories in the 50s, there's this uh, classic view from the first papers in doing machine translation research where it's, it seems just very obvious. I should be able to write a machine that can do this. You know, this word translates as this word, uh, except in this context, you know, there's a different sense, and I need to get the article right, and this language has a complex morphology, so I need to make sure that we have agreement. And it seems like, you know, maybe a daunting task, but something that's possible. Um, and I think the, the shift to neural is the first setting where researchers sort of no longer have that knob. So even with, uh, there's been, uh, you could say maybe kind of three paradigm uh, paradigms in machine translation research. So the original rule-based systems, and then the the statistical or classical era, maybe for the last two decades, and then now neural MT. Um, and it, it really, uh, I mean, we have a, a much, I think, shallower idea of how it works, uh, and our knobs are much more coarse, and a lot of the research is sort of figuring out how we can restore some control or understand what's going on a bit better. Uh, but it, uh, I, I mean, I, I can think of, uh, you know, directly reactions of researchers when they first saw the, the results of neural MT research. So it's partly because, you know, they're, researchers kind of crave novelty and uh, the old stuff felt a little bit stale, uh, but also just very impressed that this, uh, you know, set of matrix multiplications basically is able to produce uh, uh, language that's pretty fluent and often uh, quite adequate in a lot of ways. Bruno, Bruno is nodding. Uh, so the, the, the first part of, of the answer is why SMT is different from NMT. Uh, we could give some technical answers. There is word embeddings which give better synonyms for the same meaning words. Uh, the reorder, uh, which, which was a big difference, the fact that you're able now to parse a sentence completely before be beginning to decode. So it makes a huge difference between SMT, which had a, a limit of five, seven year words. It cannot reorder. But that's technical answer, the, the, the practical answer is usually when, when I, I introduce NMT to, to translators, being in WIPO or elsewhere, the, I mean, you, you, you can feel the difference, that's as simple as that. Mm. You can feel the difference, you can feel that it's doing better, I would not say understanding, because in my opinion it doesn't understand anything, but um, 
it, it does a better job at uh, looking at the full sentence and reproducing something more sensible. So then you've got pros and cons, but here I'm talking only about the pros. So definitely the NMT makes the difference. In my opinion, we are still far from human quality, whatever <laughs> you can hear in the news, but uh, yeah. John, you would agree that it's really a substantial step forward or? It, it is, so, so I guess in, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of unlocking the potential mm -hmm. To, to continue to improve further. We've done more in the last two years than probably had been done in the previous 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess like Bruno said, you know, I guess so, so to give you an idea, we have, I have, a, we have a Google Alert set up uh, for, for machine translation in the office and we get it every couple of days and you kind of, you worry every time, okay, there's a new one and you, and you kind of look through it and it's some come regular news and then you see the new press release that kind of proclaims something um, and, and you kind of hang your head and you're kind of waiting for the emails to come in from people asking you, oh, can you do this as well? Um, and so I guess there's been a history, uh, uh, at least from, there's not, there hasn't been enough of a history of expectation management from, from providers of machine translation. So it's a really delicate balance to try and strike between championing something which is really, really, really promising and, and is changing how, how things are, are being developed and it's going to change how things will go in the future, but also kind of tempering that a little bit to make sure that it doesn't get out of control because I guess where we are with neural machine translation is, like we said, with statistical, we'd probably kind of hit uh, the end of the road. There, there wasn't a lot of kind of avenues to follow. Yeah. Um, now with neural machine translation, there are so many, and it's kind of a case of, it's, it's developing so fast. There, there are new developments on a, on a monthly basis, and we kind of don't necessarily know where it's going to be, but there's excitement behind that, so we're projecting, and that projection can come across like hype, um, and so it's, I think we still, th there is promise there, but we, need to, we still need to temper things a little bit. Yes, let's, let's temper. Um, there, there is, um we're not trying to explain how neural machine translation works this morning because I've been to conferences where it was tried and it was always very painful. It involves mathematics and vector spaces and stuff. It's not for this audience. It's not for linguists to see, um, I think. Um, but I tried to understand it at some point and I read a couple of articles uh, and, and, they, they all, and they had a funny poetic turn for me because at some point the researchers who tried to explain how this works with beautiful little arrows that point to figures and numbers said, and, and then something happens in the machine that is magical. Which reminded me of, of this, this uh, quotation from uh, Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction writer from the last century who said, every advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic in the beginning until, until we get used to it. Uh, so, so we're not trying to open the box and really see how there's the inner workings are. But, but my question is, what, to our knowledge, what do we need today to actually have successful MT systems with neural things? In, in the past we said, as much data as possible for, for the statistical approach, just give us big data and just throw it at the machine. Now we, we, the, the feeling seems to be now it should also be good data, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> however we define this. Um, what, what else is there that makes an MT system that, that you commercialize yeah. uh, attractive <laughs> to buy? What makes it work? What makes it work properly? Sure. So I guess I, I want to address the, that topic of the, the magic and the black box because I think Lucia mentioned it when she was speaking that it's not a black box insofar as there are people developing the algorithms um, and, and they kind of know what they're developing. That's relative to statistical machine translation, right? So if you got some output from statistical machine translation and if it was weird, you were literally able to go back and trace why that happened. You could go into all of the, the models and you could see the likelihood that that weird translation was going to occur and potentially explain that to a customer or something like that if you needed to. We can't necessarily do that yet with neural MT, but I think it's just a matter of time because it's so new, people aren't working out yet how to kind of look back retrospectively because like I said, there's, there's still so much to look forward to. So then in terms of, okay, what are the kind of, what do we put into that? What are the ingredients uh, for successful neural MT? Again, it, it was said on, on the last panel, I think there are two key ingredients. Um, number one is the data. So data is much more important for neural MT uh, and cleaner data is, is more important. So statistical MT was a lot more robust at handling noisy data, misaligned data, and things like that. Neural MT 
is a lot more honest insofar as it will accept that data and say, I'm going to learn that this is ground truth and I'm going to produce new translations on the basis of that. So you get a lot more value out of data preparation and cleaning with neural machine translation and it, and it, it can really be a, a question of less is more where the, the less data is, is better quality. The second ingredient is people, smart people who know what to do with the data, know how to manipulate the data, know how to manipulate the algorithms if they're not producing the output that you want. And I think that's where one of the big challenges with MT is it's, it's so far away from a one-size-fits-all technology. So what happens if you use Google Translate and it doesn't produce the output you want? What happens if you have some system that allows you to drop in your translation memory to train an engine and it doesn't produce the output you want? Then you need the, you need the, the, you need the intellectual capability. You need the, the people who can look at the data, look at the output, perhaps look inside the black box and work out what's going on and, and how to make that better. And so I think they're the, the two key ingredients to successful neural MT. Bruno, do you want to add anything to that? No, I fully agree. Um, we need the clean data and smart people to, to do it. Uh, just would like to add that um, usually you, you need in-domain data also meaning that uh, there is, in my opinion, not such a thing where you, you take an uh, empty engine and incorporate and that works, and that's end of the story. It's more than that, it, in my opinion, you, as it's all about machine learning, you need to, to feed your own data to, to the machine. And when I say your own data, even if you work in a small company, uh, you more specialize in fishing ingredients or whatever, then you have to feed with such uh, parallel data. So um, ad it's it's a question of adaptation to to your your organization, and and that makes a huge difference between uh, general purpose tools like Google Translate uh, versus your own uh, tailored tool, um, and. A proper evaluation process, also, it's uh, and that's that's um, that's huge task to evaluate properly the, the the quality of of machine translation. I mean, we could talk for ages about about this, but uh, for what purpose? And do not miss that you translate for what for assimilation, for dissemination, and then you should evaluate in terms of assimilation, dissemination, and, and that's not the same task. And uh, if you've got uh, S missing somewhere, it's not a big problem if it's just the fact a uh, gist translation. While if you have a S missing somewhere, it would need additional work from the translator for post-edition, it's, it's harmful. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So I don't have too much to add. I think uh, it's been very clear so far that uh, more data, uh, there used to be this maxim in uh, statistical phase that more data is better data. And I think we're seeing now that better data is better data, or maybe you could say uh, cleaner data is better data. Um, but I, I think partially the, the success of neural MT in large data scenarios where the, the domain is a, a very common one uh, just reflects researcher interest. So you, so you go after the low-hanging fruit first. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not in the camp where we, I think uh, machine translation is going to be able to do perfect uh, uh, machine translation and you can just let it go and not have a human ever look at it. I don't think that's uh, in the stars. Um, but I think we will see better uh, machine translation in low resource scenarios. And you can think of low resource as being uh, a language pair where there's not a lot of training data for, or you could think of it as, as Bruno was talking about as um, a, di a different domain in a language you do have training data for. So all these are, are sort of low resource scenarios that MT is, or NMT is a little bit uh, brittle on. And uh, I, I think we'll, I mean, we're starting to see research papers that can do pretty good translation with, with no data in a particular language at all, or maybe just monolingual data, uh, taking advantage of uh, properties uh, uh, across languages. Um, so these are some sort of remarkable things that weren't even really conceivable uh, five years ago. And um, as the funding for this kind of projects uh, increases and, and the, the big things feel old or, or uh, see diminishing returns, I think we'll, we'll see better performance in these other scenarios as well. One thing that, that uh, John just alluded to that 
with a statistical approach and with rule-based systems before, you could very easily influence the output. In, in rule-based system, if something goes wrong, you add a rule and you're done. You add something to a dictionary, you're done. Statistical, you, a bit more difficult, but, but you could, could handle it. Now, we've heard today and we know that NMT produces very fluent results, but sometimes there are some really odd mistakes. Some are very creative, some are very funny. And it, sometimes it's uh, the, the question of... What they're, is not, they're not funny for us. I, I, I know, I know. For, for the innocent bystander, they're quite amusing. Um, and, and they're quite surprising because it comes up with funny word creations sometimes. Um, but, but, but so we, with, with NMT, we've lost a bit of this lever to say, we, you said the, the, the parameters that we can use are a bit more coarse. They're not quite as fine-tuned anymore. Do, do you see an evolution to, to get back to this or to, to save some of, of this ability that we had with older systems? Or, or does it boil down to this... Well, it's not a magic box. I, I agree somebody created the box and the people who create the boxes know how they work. But if I can't teach the machine to say, you know what, this term, please translate it always like that, then I'm a bit at the, uh, at the mercy of, of the box being black or white. Um, or is, is, is that just part of what the, how the technology works that you lose a bit of, of control, basically? There are, there are two schools of thought there. Um, so the, the, the big general use case the Google translates, Amazon translates, Microsoft translators, we'll, that will be the, the school of thought there will be, the data will work it out. We don't have the time to focus on specifics because we're going after the, we want a system that has to be able to translate any type of content. Um, from our perspective, our school of thought is, you do need those things, but it's, a, it's gonna take some time to work out exactly how to get them in. So, so Matt used the term earlier on, restoring functionality. So one of the things, so you get neural MT and all of a sudden you have a leap in quality, but now you can no longer force certain terms to be applied. Um, you can no longer influence the translations in certain ways. And so it's about working out exactly how to do that. And so developments are happening quickly. So now we can handle terminology in neural MT with what we call constrained decoding. So that has been worked out how to be done and that's being optimized even further still. So I think there will be an element of both. Uh, there will be there will be the school of, so it's about data and it's about scale um, and there will be other side where it's about focus on specific use cases and then that's where some of the, that more kind of intricacies will, will come in. Before we come to a more specific use case, because I would like to talk about translators using machine translation, neural machine translation in, in the next round. Matt, is statistical MT, is it dead? Who spend, the people who spend years of their lives figuring out how it works if they invest it into a sand castle? Yes, I think it's a, a contextualized answer. So from, uh, I mean, it was hard for a lot of us to let go. You know, you, you have a PhD in an area and now the technology is no longer useful and uh, it, takes, uh, it takes some uh, time to confront that and, uh, and move on. So a lot of us have been through that. It was painful. Um, so I think that the answer is actually uh, yes and no. Um, so... It, the answer is yes from a research perspective. So you, you don't see any research papers uh, in statistical machine translation uh, for, for reasons we've discussed or, uh, you know, earlier. Um, diminishing returns and it's just it's kind of old and there's not many new ideas and, and there's a lot to do in neural MT. Um, but from a production setting, it's certainly not the case. Um, there's a lot of uh, systems in production that are statistical too and uh, in low resource settings, uh, phrase, phrase based in uh, statistical MT in general is, is the better solution. Um, it's a very kind of case by case basis. There's some heuristics you can use uh, as a function of your training data size. You know, if you, I think uh, uh, maybe 10 million words is a sort of a crossover point where neural MT becomes better. Um, but I also think that if you look at scenarios like uh, crisis scenarios, um, so this is a, a big motivation for, I mean, US government has funded uh, some of these um, uh, um, programs where you you know you quickly want to come up with a system that can help you translate uh, Haitian Creole text messages, for example. So if I were faced with an actual situation like that, I, I wouldn't you know try to get a bunch of parallel data really quick and build a neural MT system. I would grab a dictionary and build a, a very simple phrase-based decoder that just does a dictionary translation. Um, and part of the reason for that was was mentioned in this the the, the previous panel. Um, I don't remember who said it, but it, uh, humans are, are very robust interpreters. You, they can look at something that's very noisy and, and extract the meaning out of it. So this is why you can use a very poor machine translation system, for example, to, to get the gist of a news article. 
Um, so if you just want to kind of understand the basic contours of what happened in a news article, you can throw very crummy machine translation output, which is what we did for a long time, um, at, at a human, and they'll be able to get enough information. It really sort of depends on the use case. So I mean, if you need to build something quickly and uh, you know, take a dictionary and just start augmenting it with the, the words that are out of vocabulary, and you could build something very, very quickly. Um, and uh, so I think I, I, I'd be uh, wary of uh, speculating when that kind of thing is going to change. But I think there's always going to be a, uh, a place for, for situations like that, perhaps. OK. Should we move out of the comfort zone now? No. <laughs> now we're in a room of translators, and now we should talk about just the elephant in the room, I guess. That because neural MT, just in that context you just described, is, is, is beautiful. Um, in this context, maybe not for all of us. Uh, let's talk about using neural MT in, in, in a translation context, in a translation environment. And I, I always felt, and there may be some uh, cut tool producers in the room, um, I always felt they, they kind of haven't really moved on with, with the technology. A lot of, of user interfaces that you see in, in a cut tool have not changed in the last 25 years, kind of. I mean, they've become more complicated, more colorful, surely. Not all of them. I take the trick. Don't generalize. Uh, but, but in a way, the way we, we, we use very often machine translation is, 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 is basically a post-editing paradigm. So you have a source sentence and a machine translation, and then as a translator, you're supposed to figure out if that's an accurate translation, a useful translation. And, you, and, and even if your previous sentence was perfectly well translated by your NMT system, the next one may be surprising uh, or rubbish. Um, and and um, in, in a way, for, for me, the, the, the interaction of translators with, with the technology in, in practice still seems a bit from the last century. Um, Bruno, at WIPO. <laughs> are you step So uh, at WIPO, we, we, we are the... the uh, I mean, I, I'm not in the translator side. I'm more building uh, MT that is used by translators. And uh, to give you an example, in WIPO, we've got three language services. They are using three different CAT tools. And, um, and I, I kind of agree with you that the, the current CAT tools, are, in my opinion, they are not, not that uh, well designed. However, it's easy for me to say that because I'm not in the CAT tool. So uh, <laughs> that I, I, w I would like simply to say that the, the, the future smart CAT tool has still to be invented. They, in my opinion, there is a lot to do there. There is a lot to do there. The, the, the simple thing that uh, MT is not producing one translation, it's producing usually a tree of translation, I mean, several end best, end best list. And most of the CAD tools just present the one, the first one. And why? Because it might puzzle the translator to have to look at alternative translations for every sentence. That's also why I say it's, the, the CAD tool is not well designed because th there is something to be done there. That if the translator is not happy with the translation, maybe using high track, uh, he could go for an alternative translation and then select that one. I mean, but it has to be invented. It, it, I didn't see so far something really uh, good at that. And uh, on top of that, the, 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 usually the CAT tools are doing translation at the sentence level. And that's the next generation, both in MT system and in CAT tools is to go beyond the sentence level and go to the document level. So at least the terminology is consistent uh, in different sentences. Um, and generally speaking, I would say it's context agnostic, the, the current CAT tools, and we, we would need to add some context in, in the, 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 the document we are currently translating. And uh, some speech, some image. Some if if you translate a PDF with images and it talks about a chair, I mean the chair is the is it the object or, or the person sharing the session, and and you can see it from from the context, and that's something that has to be invented. So, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, 
I mean, I don't have a lot of experience using CAT tools. Uh, I, I do remember um, a, a keynote given by uh, Spence Green, who's the uh, founder CEO of uh, Lilt. Um, maybe people have used that. Uh, so it was at uh, WMT, which is the not the workshop for machine translation, but the conference for machine translation. Uh, and that was a couple of years ago. Um, and he, he, him mentioning how, how very minor differences in the user interface had a, a very large effect on how translators uh, were used the tool and how they felt about it. Um, so I think his example was where he, where you actually put the suggestions, if it was like inline or if it was just below, and I don't remember what the right answer was. But um, I think part of maybe the issue is that a lot of these tools come out of research and they're written by engineers and uh, who are kind of, you know, deliver the tool and then go back to their research. And uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably not painting a very fair, fair picture because I'm sure there's a lot of work on, on the other side that, that I'm not familiar with. But I know that uh, graphic or GUI design and user experience is really difficult. And um, uh, if there is any sort of researcher or uh, engineering bias in the design of these tools, that's probably going to be a big impediment to their use. So, and, and as a result, there'd be a, a lot of room for, for improvement. and. Uh, just while we wait for the perfect cut tool to emerge uh, from somewhere, um, that, that solves all the issues. Do you, do you feel that using MT or NMT more specifically needs a different skill sets from translators? Is that, this morning there was a slide of questions, and, and we're going to open the floor for questions later on. Don't, don't worry, I didn't forget about it. Well, I did, but um, we will. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a question, do I have to learn to code now to use this stuff? Um, do, does a translator have to understand the inner workings of MT, or as somebody said, no, you just some principles are helpful? Is is it is it is there a new skill set that's evolving? <laughs> uh, I mean, a quick answer is uh, the computer scientists don't really know anything about language, and they're developing uh, you know the research. So uh, as a as a very high level rule, that so was way too honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I liked Lucia's answer uh, from the morning panel. That uh, I mean, I don't. I don't, I don't actually think everybody needs to learn how to code. Um, uh, that kind of, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of utility in it if it's something that's interesting, but uh, in the same sense that I don't know how a car works really, uh, unless I happen to be interested in it, uh, it, it's a really good idea to know what, what the contours and general abilities are. And um, I think John would have a lot to add to this as well um, in, in terms of how far you want to take it. Uh, but in, in terms of just the average person or even the average translator, um, I. I'm, I'm not sure how, how useful knowing really technical details are. Um, I mean, you need, to ha you need to have some familiarity and you need to know the reality beyond the hype of a lot of uh, uh, advertising and uh, marketing pushes, but um, yeah, I, I don't think you need to pick up a linear algebra textbook. But. Even though it can be fascinating, sure. probably. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, I, I agree that you do not need to know how a car uh, or the motor, the engine is working to drive a car. And I think it's the same, So, but you, to drive a car, you need some experience. And um, with NMT, I think translator, we, we are good at learning. <laughs> also humans uh, need, need to, to, to gather some experience with NMT, which is not easy because NMT is evolving. So the two tools might give different results. Um, so, and, but I think, yes, the translator need to be exposed to neural MT um, and to, to gather experience on how to use it in the best way. Um, but that's, that's a general question because usually when you recruit a translator, sometimes you've got exam on written papers, so they're not even on, on computers. So then uh, the, the, the translators have to adapt and that's, that's not never an easy, an easy task. Good. It's not an easy topic. Let's move away from it. Um, <laughs> Come, come back to a bit safer ground. Um, it was mentioned this morning, I think, that algorithms that are used to, to in, in this technology have to have a certain robustness and have to evolve to, to be robust and reliable. And with NMT, what we see is, and it was mentioned several times already today, reads good, but you don't know necessarily what you get the next time around. And, and for me, I find it always strange that a translator has to sit in front of, of the MT result and basically figure out, is this useful? But you don't, you don't have a fuzzy match value or some quality indication. Which, which I think would be helpful. Um, is there, and, and I guess in, in your line of business where you say to your customers, we can provide you good MT, I guess. 
Um, is, is there anything going on in research or in your field where you say we, we're trying to put a tag on a machine translation that says, yep, this is a good one, or the first three paragraphs are fine, but then it gets a bit fussy and you want to check this twice? Is, is that something that's done currently in research or something we can hope for? Not anymore yet, right? <laughs> so there was a, there's a field of quality estimation which is designed to try to predict the quality of, of machine translation output. And, and Lucia, who was on the last panel, is one of the world leading researchers in this area. And that happened with statistical MT around the time we reached the peak of not being able to improve it anymore. So what do you do with your resources, with your funding, when you can't necessarily make the technology better anymore? You try to say, OK, how good is it? And so we, we start to fo focus our research on trying to do that. As I've said already, now with neural MT, there's so much green space in terms of making the quality of the translations better. People are focusing their time, their energy, their resources, their funding on that, as opposed to saying, because you could develop a methodology that predicts how good the current state of the art in neural machine translation is, and by the time you're 25% through that research project, the state of the art has moved on, and the technologies you've developed are no longer appropriate. So that's what I mean by we're not, it's not, there again yet because that's where the energies are focused. Arguably, when we get around to it, neural MT will lend itself better to approaches to quality estimation because, again, in that black box somewhere there, we suspect that neural MT will, is inherently better at knowing why it's producing it and saying how confident it is and why it's produced that. And therefore, at, at a certain stage, somebody smart will you know, hit on that thing that says, oh, if we actually take this information from here and this information from here, we get a really reliable number out that gives us an idea as to how good the translation is. I don't know when that's going to happen, um, but I, it, it will eventually. I could. Hello? No, I think it's. It will. I, just to add to that, is this dead too? <laughs> okay. Uh, just to add to that, I could. Uh, I think it, in some ways you can think of uh, quality estimation as being as difficult as machine translation itself. Uh, because if you had a perfect quality estimator, you could run your output through it. And if it said it wasn't good enough, you could keep getting different machine translation systems and run it through until your quality estimator said it was perfect. So uh, I say that and, and add to what John said, um, just in order to sort of establish expectations about you know what uh, might be achieved. So it, uh, that's not to say that it's a hopeless task. I mean, we're still doing machine translation research, but uh, it, it seems like it's this kind of, it's sort of a deceptively difficult task. It seems like it's something simple. You should just be able to tell me, you know, is this word good or not, and, and so on. Um, but it's it's actually uh, uh, fairly difficult. Yes, you usually have got difficulties to 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 explain to translators that why I, I do not provide a quality score to each of my translation, because they say that would be extremely useful. Yes, that would be extremely useful, but it's ex extremely difficult. Yes. It, it, it's as, at least as difficult as machine translation is itself. Mm -hmm. So it, it's yet another task and yet another project, yet another set of theses and, mm -hmm. and, and scientific papers on the subject. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> I, I hoped for more. Uh, okay, now let's go from that very difficult topic to another one that is difficult and sensitive and nobody wants to talk about it. Um, but while we're here, um, when we have a lot of translators in the room and we ha also have a lot of managers in the room who are responsible for translation services in one way or the other. And they come with questions on, so what does this mean, this wonderful technology for productivity of colleagues? without any hind thoughts, just, just like that, just to know. Um, that is very touchy, obviously. And, and you can have uh, colleagues who love machine translation, but say it, it actually takes a bit longer because, you know, I, uh, it's fascinating. I start playing around with it instead of just straight revising it. Um, but there are different schools of thought. Is that, and I'm looking at John, because again, <laughs> you, have a, you, you basically have a, an easy matrix to measure, <laughs> which is money. Um, 
Is, is that something that, that you have a handle on, or, or, or is, it, is it even a sensible debate? Is it just uh, an obsession of some managers and we should just not, not worry about it and say, this is another tool in the toolbox that we use as good as we can with uh, colleagues who know the tools, have, have, an, have an idea and use them to the best potential? And, and move on and sure. don't talk about it anymore. Okay, so so I, I said earlier on at the beginning that I, I would give some insights, I guess, from, from our perspective, and, and, and this, is, this is one side of them. I think it's probably the right time to, I guess, to, to, to set out the fact that, I guess, from, first of all, it's not a case of, of human versus machine when it comes to machine translation, right? Um, they, are, they are distinct approaches to solving the challenge of translation and they can be complementary and that's what we're talking about in this case is the is where they overlap um, so machine translation as a technology translates about a billion words every day right um, I would say from our company's perspective 70% of all of the words that we machine translate are not post edited right they are they are use cases where um, where it doesn't require post-editing. It's this gisting. It's there's there's too much volume that needs to be turned around in in too short a space of time. Uh, at the other end of that spectrum, it was mentioned on the last panel as well. There are translation use cases where machines are not viable at all. Um, I won't go into what they are, but it can be dependent on the language, be dependent on the content type, and then the intersection there is where machine translation can be a complementary tool to the the process of the translator how much productivity you can get out of that then is so variable. It depends on so many factors that it's, it's very hard to give a, 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 a kind of a single answer to say machine translation gives this type of productivity. There are machine translation systems that will give you negative productivity because the output will be so not fit for purpose that you know, you're better, you, you have to read it and then you have to scrap it and translate from scratch so you lose that bit of time. There will be other systems that will produce perfect output in some cases and less so in other cases. And so you maybe get, you know, I, I'm not going to give a percentage because I don't want to be quoted on a percentage, but you will get some. The more effort you go into adapting the machine translation for the specific task, the specific content type, the specific individual, the more benefit you will get from that. And so I guess our fear is often that people's uh, impressions of machine translation come from the general tools that have not been developed with the, with the individual translator in mind. So Bruno made a great point earlier on, right? There are certain types of errors that an MT system will make that it doesn't matter um, to be able to understand the document. However, if someone is revising that, editing that, that could be the type of issue that will impact the, the productivity. And so if you're going to, so let's call that a bug in the machine translation. That's not a bug from the, from the information purposes use case. And so the developer is not going to try and fix that. If you try to fix that for the translator who's using it, you will see the benefits of that. And it will see the you'll see the benefit directly in them not having to, the translator not having to edit that mistake anymore. And it will also you know, give the, the, the user a better impression of the technology and they might be more kind of liable to, 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 to work with it again. So, that's a, a, a non-answer for you in terms of how much productivity you can get, but it's, it's some of the ingredients that go into how uh, development around MT can impact the productivity of, of, of linguists. Do you also have a feel-good answer for me? Yes, so uh, something not to, to forget, that there, there, there is uh, stuff that are not translated and that will never be translated by any humans. Give you an example, the, if you want... How much you actually have to do is, is really, it's a political question, I think, uh, ultimately. Um, and I thereby wash my hands of it. <laughs> and the apple will, apples will be bruised, oh, the, the ones that fall. Okay, let's have a look at Slido. I, I will skip the first one on the revision versus post-editing because we have in the afternoon a panel that is much closer to, to translators and how translators use the technology. Um, the, the second question uh, about... Um, no, it's gone. <laughs> the last, somebody said in the last TEFO, one or two years ago, we had freelancers who were very excited about uh, reporting on their own SMT systems that they build based on Moses, which is a, is a framework that's been around for a long time and very stable. Um, and now they lost, <laughs> they lost this, basically. Is there a point they can turn to? Does it make sense? Or is, is that an exotic thing for some, some experts to build your own MT uh, in your basement? Or... <laughs> So I, is, it, is it a viable I, approach? I recommend living room, but basement is fine as well. I, I said because I once I talked to a freelancer who said, uh, of course, we don't 
we don't send our documents out to the Googles of the world, and not even to the iconic uh, translation machines because they're so confidential we don't trust even the transfer. And he said, I want a thing in my basement, <laughs> probably with a program and sitting next to it. But, but is, is that something that is, uh, where, where, first of all, can, can you guide people who wish to explore NMT? Is there like this one point you go to like you had with, with uh, the SMT systems where you said, try Moses and see how far you get? The, so from, from experience, uh, um, <laughs> I was recruited to build uh, our own uh, MT system in, in WIPO. So it's doable. Uh, it requires time, it requires uh, specific skills, but it's, it's doable. You, you can even recruit a master degree who will then specialize in MT and ask him to try to build his own MT system. Uh, it is doable, so I very often got the, the answer, why the hell are you doing this? Because it's not our core competencies, there are actors, uh, Google, uh, Deeper, etc., doing the same. And the answer is because I think I can do better, simply. Because when you do with your domain, with your, your own data, you, you still can do better. In a small company, it's difficult because then you have to gather proper data, etc. Um, the, the answer is balance. It's a big risk. It's a big risk because you, you have to pay somebody for one year to study the technology, to try to apply it, and maybe in one year after you have to, do, uh, to say, no, let's cancel, it doesn't work. So r very risky investment, but uh, it's worth trying sometimes. So, so I'd say from the, from the freelancer perspective, the question directly, what should they use now to tradition, tr transition to personal NMT? There's Marion, there's Open NMT, there's Fairsec, there's Sockeye, there's um, AutoML. There are lots of open source tools. So all of the big tech companies are open sourcing um, what they're doing around neural MT. It's probably not the state of the art. They're probably keeping, it's probably six months behind, but it's all open source. It's, 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 part, of their, it's part of their strategies. Um, however, uh, the transition might be a bit harder, right? So I guess the, the first thing, uh, we had somebody from NVIDIA on the last panel, you can't do this on your laptop. Uh, you need much more compute power. You need GPUs, graphical processor units. They're not cheap to do it on the cloud, is not cheap. Um, so that's gonna be one issue. And then if we talked about the two key ingredients to successful neural machine translation earlier on, it's number one, having clean data. So you, if you wanna build your own neural MT system, you need to know how to process your data, how to clean it for effective neural MT training, and how to manipulate it in that regard. And then you have the second part, which Bruno touched on there, is the expertise, right? What do you do if it doesn't work? Um, it's likely to be a lot more sensitive to what your data is, so what happens there? So you can transition, the tools are there if you have the data that you had previously. It's, it's essentially the, the same idea, how smoothly that transition will go. Um, remains to be seen. So there, are, I guess there are, you have three options. You use the off-the-shelf tools like Google, you try to train your own, and then you have somebody train it for you. There, the, there are, I guess, the, the three options, and you have to find which one works most effectively. Yeah, and to add, there, a lot of these toolkits too have, I mean, if you're at all technically inclined, you can download the toolkit and walk through a tutorial that tells you how to download the WMT data and build a model and how to pre-process it. And, a lot of times there's a script that'll do all this for you with a, a few pieces of manual intervention. Um, so you, you do need a GPU, like John said, but uh, this is kind of an answer directed just towards people with some kind of technical inc inclination. There's no reason why you couldn't build an MT system and run it on your own computer and build an interface on top of that and, and use it for uh, yourself if you had, had the skills. And if you didn't jot down all the open source technologies that John just rattled down, <laughs> find him in the lunch break, he will give you the names. Uh, is there any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. Hi, my question is particularly for, uh, for John and Bruno, and it's about, uh, I'm wondering if you can describe more your data pipeline, going from sort of collection and cleaning, uh, and in particular, the process of uh, adding data as you're working on a project to bring, uh, bring the quality up. Uh, as you're kind of doing an error analysis, you would add more, uh, add more data to improve the model. Uh, what does that look like in your organizations? 
without being in obtuse, um, or being potentially intentionally obtuse, that's kind of what we do as a company. That's that's how we add value over the the tools that are on the market, the free tools. So that's there's so there's no right answer. It 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 differs on a case by case basis, on a client by client basis, on a data set by data set basis. Uh, we have kind of methodologies. We have things that we know to try for some languages over others. Um, suffice to say, there is a lot of that. There is a big pipeline, and I would say. 40% of the effort that we put into building an empty engine is happens before we actually start the training and then kind of during the training process doing different iterations. So when we deliver a single engine to a client, we've probably built 20 to 25 versions of that engine in-house before selecting which kind of set of parameters, which set of cleanings and processings actually, actually work. So um, that's, I guess, some, some indication. <laughs> Uh, so from, from our experience, what we try to aim at is simply that you, you, for organizations who want to use WIPO Translate, they, they put their documents, docx, and as soon as they produce it, we, they put it in some repository, and we try to build a pipeline that does everything. Uh, convert, uh, align, train, etc. From, from that. But that does not always work. But uh, let's say that's our goal, <laughs> to just press one boot button to, to retrain. Because the, the, uh, you know, in addition to get clean data, you need to get recent data to, to get better translations. So, but we, it's not that we do manage to do it in a proper way, always. In, in any case, uh, talking about workflow on pipeline, everything has to be automatic. So that you can launch it over the weekend and get something two weeks after. But purely automatic because it, it's not that a human will not improve the system, but it's simply that uh, usually you have to retrain every now and then, and if each, each time you need to have humans to clean, etc., it, it will take too much time, and then you will not cope with, with the workflow. Good. We have one more question over there. I'm going to speak French. Um, I could speak English as well. It, we're talking about languages, aren't we, and saying how important languages are, but everybody's speaking English, so I thought I'd speak French. My first question for WIPO in particular, because I work on legal translations and we've had, ex we've had experiences where similar words are then taken out of context and mistranslated. So once you have a trans the translation, a ready translation, is there a person then who looks at it, who reads it through and says, well, that doesn't make any sense, we'll change that? Or is that something that doesn't actually happen? I don't know if I should answer in French oh, or in English. <laughs> so it's, it's funny. Uh, it's true that it's a, a rather strange phenomenon. I'm thinking in French. I'm speaking English, and then there's an interpreter who takes my English and translates it back into French. Bon, je, je vais parler, je vais en français. But I'll answer in French, therefore. In WIPO, patent translation, every translation is a human translation. So there's nothing that would suggest that a machine translation is, that it's just a machine that does the translation. You have translators, human beings. It can be outsourced, but it's a human being who is ultimately responsible for the translation and has to be responsible for the translation. I'd be the first one to say that uh, I wouldn't want um, I wouldn't want to get into an aeroplane where the user's manual had actually been translated by my tool. I wouldn't want to get into that aeroplane. I think in certain areas, particularly in the legal uh, area, I think. Uh, that they're the best a supervisor is a human translator, an experienced human translator who works well, of course. I think that when it comes to automatic translation, machine translation, I think that translators do have a responsibility to try and 
work towards creating the best translations. I work with other international organizations and advocate uh, their ac actually making it available to the public uh, sphere, all of the translated work uh, that they have, so that a team in India, for example, could create a good transla translation using the, the tools and the information that they have. This lunch is waiting, and I, I feel a bit hungry. I don't know about you. But I have one last question for, for, this, for our three panelists. Uh, neural, neural MT has come out quite fast from seemingly nowhere. Do you have a, a feeling or do you have a crystal ball that tells you what the next trends are for Neural MT? Or if, you, if we came back again in five years and looked back on, on what we know today, would we say, oh, we knew nothing? Uh, is, is there another paradigm shift in the making or are there trends that we should be aware of? There are many trends. I'll, I'll give one because um, it's it's quite stark at the moment. Matt has Matt has talked about it already, and that's machine translation for what we call low resource languages. So languages where there's typically not a lot of training data because less people speak the languages, um, or they they haven't been big markets, um, and so there's a lot of work going on at how to train machine translation, neural machine translation engines with, without any data, with limited amounts of data, with data that was created synthetically. Um, and so that's a, that's a big research area. Actually, one of the, the biggest um, kind of advocates of that groups working on that is Facebook, because as you can imagine, they have hundreds of millions of users who speak all sorts of different languages. They want to be able to provide machine translation for that, and so they have to, to work out how to solve problems. So they've, they've been writing some really interesting work on that. So I would say that's an area where our starting point is quite far back in terms of where MT is generally. Uh, and so that's an area where I would say to, to keep an eye on in, in terms of how it's going to trend into the future. Uh, I think uh, a move that's picking up recently is to do document level translation. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of a sign of how machine translation has affected uh, translation, I think, is that we force this sort of sentence by sentence paradigm, um, which I think is a fairly unnatural act when you're doing uh, translation. Um, but there's been a lot of work and kind of a push to try to solve uh, problems that are cross sentential in nature. So. Uh, you can't predict the right uh, natural gender for a pronoun, for example, if you don't have uh, the appropriate context. Um, so uh, that, that's been a, uh, something that's starting to pick up and it's something we know how to do or have an idea of how to approach now, at least. Um, so that, that, I think that's another uh, piece in addition to the low resource language. Um, yes, uh, I, I fully agree what, with what you said. I mean, not to forget that languages are not the, the six official languages of UN, but uh, I would like a Swahili speaker to be able to read a, a patent in Russian, for example. Uh, so overcoming the language barrier uh, for, uh, is one of the challenge, and I think that can be done. And otherwise, a multimodal machine translation also to, to, to be able to translate speech or using even, uh, uh, even image and uh, etc. So that's, that's and yeah, apart from that, it's difficult to know what will be the, 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 the quality in, in five years from now. Thank you very much. Don't be alarmed. It is, this very discreet alarm is just a test, I hear. So we... We could stay longer, but we shouldn't because the lunch is waiting. In the meantime, colleagues have put up a, a Slido poll on the question, how do you think MT will affect the language pro profession? And you see half of you think that it will change it into something different. And 1% of people who answered said it will have no impact. I guess that is from the colleagues who translate poetry.